Electric vehicles have been pushed as the fix for pollution. Governments are starting to ban the sale of cars that use internal combustion and are only allowing EV sales with deadlines as close as 2035. But are electric cars really the answer to emissions? Or are the manufacturers feeding us the benefits while the skeletons are being hidden in a high security closet? Before we begin this discussion, I want to outline what credentials I offer and any biases I may have. That way I can be as transparent as possible and show you where I'm coming from as an individual. I went to school for electrical engineering and took an emphasis on robotics automation and controls. My internship and then first full-time engineering job was at a company that did electric powertrains ranging from hybrid systems to full electric systems, both for automotive and aviation environments. The company was mostly focused on aerospace, but I was involved in some automotive projects. I have an NDA, so I can't disclose what company I work for or what customers I work with, and admittedly, I have to be careful not to share proprietary information, so I will do my best to give you the most information I can without breaching that. I wore a few different hats within this company, but most notably as a test engineer and a manufacturing engineer. As a test engineer, I would come up with certain profiles to run for the batteries, run them in certain conditions, and even do destructive testing. And as a manufacturing engineer, that one's a little more self-explanatory, but essentially coming up with how to build the batteries. And I was involved with automating some of those processes. Now for my biases. I'm a car enthusiast. I love the internal combustion engine. There's a passion for cars within me, as there's a passion for the internal combustion engine. I firmly believe there is a more organic connection between man and machine when the car has an internal combustion engine. Don't get me wrong though, the performance an electric car delivers is astonishing, and at a younger age, I thought electric cars were going to be the superior one day. With that put on the table, let's talk about physics for a second. Blow off the dust from that old physics textbook and fire up some Bill Nye, because we're going to talk about the law of conservation of energy. The law of conservation of energy essentially states that energy cannot be created nor destroyed. The implication is energy can only be converted and transferred. In relation to an electric car, the electricity used to charge that vehicle has to come from somewhere. It doesn't just magically appear in your outlets. One thing to consider is the energy density of batteries. Energy density is the ratio of how much energy something can store in relation to how much space it occupies. As of filming this, it takes 100 pounds of lithium ion batteries to travel the same distance as one pound of gasoline. But we need to take into consideration the efficiency of the propulsion device. Right now, Toyota is able to get gasoline engines to 40% efficient, where the other 60% are energy losses in the form of heat going into the cooling system and exhaust coming out of the tailpipe. An electric vehicle is 80% efficient, and the other 20% is lost in the forms of heat and other energy losses. So we can't argue with the fact that electric vehicles use the energy more efficiently, but if we calculate the ratio of efficiency to density, Gasoline is 40% efficient, where lithium ion batteries are 0.8% efficient. So how efficient is it overall, if it requires more raw materials to achieve the same outcome? This brings us to our next point, how it's manufactured. The process for mining lithium is quite resource intensive. It takes around 500,000 gallons of water to mine one ton of lithium. Sources vary in what the final number is, but it's at least 500,000 gallons from my research. To put this in perspective, let's take a cell phone battery to use as an example. We'll need to know a couple things before we can make these calculations. First of all, we're going to have to figure out what the watt hour rating of our battery is. We can calculate that with our milliamp hour rating and our voltage. We take milliamp hours divided by a thousand, multiply it by our voltage, and we get our watt hours. Then we're going to need to know how much lithium there's going to be. 8 grams of lithium is equal to a 100 watt hour battery. That gives us a 12.5 gram per one watt hour ratio. With that said, we can calculate how much lithium is going to be in our iPhone battery. An iPhone 13 uses one singular battery cell, a 3227 milliamp hour battery with a nominal voltage of 3.84 volts. We divide the 3227 by 1000, then multiply by 3.84. That gives us a 12.39 watt hour battery. We then divide that by 12.5, our ratio, and that gives us 0.9912 grams of lithium in one iPhone 13 battery. One ton of lithium can produce 900,000 batteries for cell phones, which sounds like a lot, but consider how many people in this world have cell phones, then how many other devices use one or more of these battery cells. 
Now let's take a Tesla Model S Plaid for example. The Tesla Model S Plaid uses 18650 battery cells like the one I have here. It uses 7920 of these batteries. They're 3400 milliamp hour rated with a nominal voltage of 3.6 volts. If we use the equation we used earlier, that comes up to 0.97 grams of lithium in each one of these cells. Multiply that to 7920 and that gives us 7682 grams of lithium using each Model S Plaid. So with that, we know that 500,000 gallons of water can make 118 Tesla Model S Plaids. Now, there's 1.4 billion cars in the world. If we wanted to replace each one with an electric vehicle like that, that would come up to a lot of water needed. Have you noticed any droughts lately this year? We haven't taken into account the environmental damage that mining can cause. Now, some lithium mines are in arid, remote deserts that don't have much life. Nonetheless, you still need water, and if these mines are in dry deserts, the water has to be brought in from somewhere. Now, not all these mines are strategically placed to avoid the disruption of local life. In Tibet, the mines there have destroyed the soil and polluted the water. The water is bringing diseases to the locals and killing the fish in the water, and the soil is unsuitable for agriculture. Done improperly, the mining of lithium can be very destructive to the environment, but lithium batteries can also be very destructive after they've been produced. Thermal runaway, the term given to when a battery essentially catches fire or explodes. Thermal runaway was also the name of my failed punk rock band, but that's a story for another day. Thermal runaway can be caused by a few different methods, overcharging the battery, overheating the battery, or puncturing the battery. The event can be quite violent and destructive. The worst part is, if one individual cell goes into thermal runaway, it can propagate to the surrounding cells like a domino effect. I myself have run a few thermal runaway tests. And we'll just say, they can get kinda hot. Now I will say, a well-designed battery will try to vent out the gases and energy if one cell goes into thermal runaway and help prevent it from propagating to the other cells. Recently there was a Tesla in a car accident and it went to thermal runaway, not immediately though. Three weeks after the accident, while it was in the scrapyard. When a battery goes into thermal runaway, it is incredibly hard to stop. Even though they make lithium ion fire extinguishers, you can't really stop thermal runaway. You can only contain it and let the chemical reaction finish. From my prior work experience, we would have burn barrels filled with water, and if a battery went into a thermal runaway event, that battery would be pushed into the barrel where it could then be contained in the water. This is essentially what firefighters had to do with the Tesla in the scrapyard that caught on fire. They dug a big hole, they pushed the Tesla in, they filled it with water, and that's how they contained it and let it burn until it finished. The reason this is a concern is statistically, there's a car accident about every six minutes. Now, that's not to say each of those are major accidents, but you can imagine how much more frequent the scenario with the Tesla in the scrapyard would happen if every car on the road was electric. Look, I know it sounds like I'm anti-electric car, but I'm not. You can't deny that they're cool, they're fast, the performance is undeniable, and the technology is just wicked. Like, electric cars are sick, let's be honest, okay? But what I'm trying to show you guys is that just because there's no tailpipe emissions doesn't mean they're perfectly clean. It just means the issue's been shifted somewhere else and that they come with their own new set of issues. Admittedly, I chose to be an electrical engineer because I wanted to design and work on electric cars myself. And after working in the industry, the rose-tinted glasses are now off. Well, more like the industry sucker punched me in the face, the rose tinted glasses flew across the room and were crushed on impact. But same difference. Electricity isn't just some magical thing that every building has. It has to come from somewhere. It is a form of energy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. Where your energy comes from is very important in terms of how clean your EV is. If your local power grid is powered from coal, then your car is essentially coal powered. Whereas if you have a source of clean energy, then your EV is actually clean to operate. Another thing to consider is how much energy is going to be needed from the energy grid for this. Now, imagine you take 7,000 cell phones and you plug them in every night at your house. Now, imagine everyone in your city doing the exact same thing. That's going to take a lot of go juice. This last year alone, we already saw major issues with our energy grids. During the summer, the California government urged residents to turn up their AC during a major heat wave to help conserve electricity. I grew up in Southern California. It gets hot. No way I would want to turn up or even turn off my AC during the summer. Last year, 18% of new car sales were EVs. It's already showing that the grid can't handle it. See, what I'm trying to say is, we're really putting the cart in front of the horse with this whole EV thing. I feel our legislations have already put too many eggs into the wrong basket. We are already running into energy issues today that make EV only landscape of 2035 seem quite improbable. 
Admittedly, it is easier to complain and not present any other solutions. So, why haven't we invested more into hybrid systems like Toyota has? It seems like the next logical step is to mandate every new car being hybrid, not skip a step and jump to full EV. To back this, Toyota themselves have created a coalition with other Japanese manufacturers to defend and continue the development and use of the internal combustion engine. Toyota, a company known for its reliability and efficiency, isn't on board with going fully EV. That speaks volumes there. And that's not to say Toyota doesn't want to make the investment into EV. Have you heard of the Prius? It's already partially EV, that's why it's a hybrid. They already have so much R&D into that platform, you would think they would be the first to go on board with going fully EV. And them not wanting to speaks tons of volume. Other companies like Porsche are investing in R&D for the production of carbon neutral fuels and as of recently, it's starting to show more promise. I like this scenario the best personally because if we find a carbon neutral fuel that works and is cost efficient, it can already go into the existing infrastructure we already have built. Moving towards cleaner energy generation is something that needs more focus as well. This way EVs could be less disruptive to our power grid and be overall cleaner to operate. Investing in nuclear power would really help quite a bit. Another investment would be public transportation. There is a considerable amount of people who could care less about owning their own vehicle and operating it. I'm not one of those, but hey, if you get more people's cars off the road, making my commute a bit less traffic dense, I'm all for it. You see, the truth is, there isn't one solution in our current society. Everything is so dynamic in our world. Everyone's individual case is different. There can't be one answer. The real solution, in my opinion, is it's going to be a mix of everything. EVs, hybrids, and internal combustion vehicles, sprinkled on top with more public transportation. Putting our eggs into multiple baskets is the path towards success. I hope this video is informative for you guys watching. I have to admit, it was kind of hard doing research for this video, as there's a lot of misinformation out there. It was really blatant that a lot of articles are biased towards one side or the other on this whole EV thing. I'm glad that my work experience was there for me to help me cut through a lot of this misinformation, and I really hope you as a viewer were able to take away something from this video. So thank you for watching this video, and I hope to see you in one of my future videos.